Well, a very good uh, morning to everyone, uh, and thank you for joining uh, this SFE Fujitsu event. It's the second in a planned series of six. Um, it follows the hugely successful event on the 25th of August, which we had over 106 uh, attendees at, where we looked at workplace transformation um, and accelerating innovation and adoption. Um, <clears throat> and looking at you know the situation immediately beyond the immediate response demanded by COVID-19. Um, we're in for a fascinating discussion, um, I believe, uh, this morning. So we're going to be looking at driving success across financial services and professional services uh, through fintech collaboration, um, innovation and adoption, and again, looking at it beyond COVID-19. So we've got a forward-looking lens on this event. Uh, we have an absolute glittering cast of speakers this morning. I'm delighted to uh, be chairing, and uh, uh, we have Ian uh, Bradbury of Fujitsu, who is uh, going to be facilitating. So it's great to be working with Ian again. Um, we have Matt James um, from NatWest. Matt is head of scouting for UK and Europe. Uh, we have Richard Caldicott. Uh, from Prudential. Uh, Richard is the Deputy CEO for Prudential Financial Planning and Director of Customer uh, Solutions. Uh, we have James Barga, who is joining us from Lewis, uh, not far from the butt of Lewis. So uh, a huge welcome and uh, amazing clarity with your, with your picture as well. So a very warm welcome, James. We're very much looking forward to hearing from you. And we have my very close friend, Stephen Ingledew, the CEO of FinTech Scotland. Uh, who I think is running on adrenaline just now. I think he's got something like 85 events. This event forms part of Scotland's FinTech Festival. And also we have an independent speaker, a renowned speaker, who is Leda Glyptis. So Leda, you're very, very welcome. And thank you for joining this event. Um, so without any further ado, I will hand you across now um, to Ian who will be facilitating the session. And given the size of the session, I suspect we'll struggle uh, to fit in um, Q&A uh, on this occasion, but we very much want to receive your questions. So if, if you have any questions, please uh, send them in to Laura Rafferty in Fujitsu, who is standing by. So without any further ado, um, I'll hand you over now to Ian. Ian. Thank you, Graham, and delighted to be working with you again um, in this event. Um, as, as Graham said, we had a very successful event last time, which was focused on, on workforce transformation. Um, the topic moves this time to fintech collaboration, um, but really from the same perspective. So we are, we are focusing in on fintech collaboration post-COVID. Um, we, we know uh, before COVID that um, uh, lots of exciting uh, collaboration was done with fintech and, and large existing organisations. We also know that the models were evolving and changing around how that collaboration worked, with many organizations trying to find the best way um, of collaborating with FinTech. Um, so the world has moved on. Um, as we did last time, we will start with uh, some poll questions for the audience to, to get you uh, awake. So um, Laura, would you be able to put up the, the first question, please? So a somewhat controversial question to get you going first thing in the morning. Let's have the views out there. Enough time, have we got, got a reasonable response back, Laura? Yeah, so 100% said uh, FinTech will quickly rebound. Okay, sorry, I didn't see that on my screen. Thank you. Brilliant, well, that's a really positive response first thing in the morning um, and uh, a big downer on McKinsey <coughs> for that. <laughs> so, can we have the next question, please, Laura? Okay, I think we're above 80% now of people have voted, which is a great response. And uh, most people believe that we can replicate um, the, the FinTech hubs in the virtual world, which once again is an incredibly positive response. So I think that's uh, a unanimous vote for, uh, for FinTech going forward. Um, let's, let's start with, um, with Matt. I mean, obviously this is a very uh, important area for your organization and, and what you do. Um, what's your perspective on the the, uh, the, the McKinsey viewpoint at the moment? Um, do, do you think it is uh, it is an existential moment for fintech, or do you think we can move forward rapidly? Um, I, I, I suppose 
for, from my perspective, the thing that I've always seen um, in technology innovation is that whether it's fintechs or other startups, they are extremely resilient and very good at adapting and evolving to whatever whatever the new situation uh, arises. And I think you know with with the post COVID situation, the difficulties uh, in the economy, and you know, and I think also with the you know the acceleration of the move to sort of digital channels particularly in financial services i think that you know that opens up a huge opportunity for fintechs um and for other startups to, to, to really make a contribution um you know and I, I guess from from the bank's perspective as well you know we've always had working with startups and fintechs as part a core part of our um of our of our strategy and our approach to innovation, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. Thank you. Um, Ledek, if I can come to you, because you, you've sat on both sides of the fence um, in, in, in previous roles, so you have a particular perspective. Do you think COVID creates a, a really strong opportunity for us to, uh, to move forward quite rapidly with innovation, with fintech organisations working together with with those large established banks and insurance companies? I think it creates uh, an opportunity, it creates the pressure, it creates um, a realization that some of the things we've been talking about as necessary and potentially inevitable in our future, um, sort of uh, now existential, not for the sector, but for the way we do business and, and services we provide to communities. I would also say that um, what has been um, a, a type of collaboration that has largely moved to the pace and preference of the larger entities, um, as, as Matt says, it has been part of, uh, of bank strategies, but it has also been a, a part of a strategy that was uh, more about hedging, managing transitions, experimenting, learning and moving rather slowly and in a way that was more about um, the bank's needs, pace, compliance and all the rest of it. Um, in recent years that had started gear shifting. Um, what we are seeing is a realization that that acceleration is absolutely essential, not for the bank, not for the startup, but for the market and the services we provide. I haven't seen anyone doing that yet, but it is actually early and I remain hopeful that people will say, you know what, we've played at this on the margins for about 10, 15 years. Now it's time to really accelerate the things that will be transformative for our infrastructure and the way we deliver services. Thank you. I, I guess what you're, what you're really saying is that the banks and the insurance companies probably need more focus around what they do um, work with fintechs on and um, maybe moving on from just simple experimentation into uh, into um, really aligning with business objectives. Um, J James, I know you know you, you've obviously taken a, a, an organisation right the way through from from a, a, a small beginnings to to something that's that's quite successful now. Is is that your perspective? Is is it time to get away from experimentation and and into um, a, a aligned with very clear objectives? Uh, yeah, well, first of all, I think we still have a lot of work to do before we, uh, we class ourselves as successful, but uh, absolutely, I think, you know, having tried to sell into financial services as a fintech for, for five, ten years now, the industry is still paralyzed with this idea of doing anything different, right? The risk adversity is so high that, you know, it just, it just it's, it's like having a straitjacket. Everyone's walking around in a straitjacket in a padded room almost. Um, and I think, I think the pandemic is really good for getting people to think about doing something different or realizing that they just can't always do the same thing, which is the safe route. And innovation in fintech and, and working with financial services is a great example of this where we have to move into production environments. It's not just innovation teams, proof of concepts. It's not just little side projects that, that get some interaction with fintech. We have to find ways of bringing those fintech organizations into production environments at scale, right? Otherwise, that innovation is never going to have an impact for anybody. Um, and I think, I mean, to Lito's point, it's still a huge challenge. Uh, and, and, you know, when you combine it with everything else right now, with 
with the lack of funding going to fintechs. I mean, the reality is, you know, I think we are in a bit of a crisis because fintechs are reliant on funding generally, right? I think, you know, there's very few that are profit making uh, in mm -hmm. the world. Um, and, and because of that, if the, there isn't any funding there, then, you know, they're going to be under increasing pressure. And there is a huge opportunity for financial services to take a step forward and, and work with fintechs and, and help save some of those fintechs by 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 doing something meaningful with them and not just not just a, a a nice press release and you know the 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 bolstering of you know hey we've got an innovation team we're doing some cool things but how do we how do we step that into into the banks actually adopting uh, adopting those 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 solutions you know thank thank you James I, I I guess you know once again switching back to the other side of the fence. Um, you know, Richard, you've you've uh, um, obviously been uh, working through your innovation planning. Um, you've had engagement with fintechs. You've you've had engagement with consultancy organisations. How do you see your organisation um, evolving to to work more closely and get more out of working with fintechs? I mean, the the, the upside or the the reality of our current situation is that we are, as a corporation, much more risk averse. Less risk aversion, sort of where you know, sort of have to take different decisions that we wouldn't have taken. And hopefully, and uh, this will be the challenge, that can be the start of our, our ongoing opening up of our thinking rather than our entrenchment post COVID. That, that worries me a little bit. Need, we've got a need for innovation, which is um, ever more than it was before. Actually, we've probably got more funding than before to make transformational change. COVID forces that. So it's definitely an opening and an opportunity for <laughs> The bit that worries me, you know, in our business, and I think James spoke about this earlier on, was we are as a as a certainly my my business is certainly um, always looking for the safest way to deliver something. And that I think becomes a difficult problem when it comes to finding the right way to collaborate with fintechs. We were speaking last week, James and I, about the fact that he's 10 years plus, I think, since since founding. And I've got a bit of work on the go at the moment with fintechs. And I was looking at this after that conversation. And all four fintechs I'm dealing with are all 10 years old uh, in the RFP process. And that makes them a lot easier for me to deal with. And therefore, the real challenge for me is how do we help fintechs who are not 10 years old come into our businesses and work with us? And that, for me, is still a difficult problem to solve. Uh, but there's definitely more, more appetite, more need, and more demand for innovation than we had only six months ago. Thank you, Richard. Um, interesting, you mentioned the, the, the words RFP process there. Um, that, that doesn't really strike me as necessarily an ideal model to, to engage with fintech. Maybe it is. Um, I, I know because I'm, I'm involved in a lot of those types of activities that that's the way that large existing organisations work and, and almost mandated to work. Stephen, you know clearly you 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 represent um, an organisation that that's perhaps having to fight those battles every day. What's your view? Is that the right way to to uh, to uh, have have a dialogue with a fintech? Yes, yeah. As, as always with any relationship, um, it's two sided really. It's helping the enterprises, fintechs really, the small enterprise to get a greater understanding, empathy of what the needs are and how best to navigate those in a large enterprise. And then the, on the other side, the large incumbent really kind of better understanding of what it means to work with a smaller enterprise. So it's that bringing together the emotional intelligence on both sides to make it effective and more efficient. There's a lot of time wasting, there's a lot of froth, and it was touched on, I think, by James really. It, it's, in the past, what large institutions have done is set up sort of specialist innovation hubs as if FinTech is just for the few, rather than bringing it into the main organisation to make it pervasive. So creating specialist hubs, which really largely, I think, have been a waste of time, have not been very effective, haven't helped the fintech sector do it, and haven't helped the, helped the large incumbents. So get away from the specialism, make it pervasive, and into the operations of the business. Uh, there are some good role models out there. I'm saying like NatWest World Bank, Lloyds Bank, um, and you do see some great examples. Some others are emerging, but it's just not going fast enough. And so there needs to be this real sort of step change in mindset, both for the fintechs in truth, but also particularly the leaders of the larger enterprises 
uh, who need to make that step change in the way that they engage with innovation and move away from a specialist, specialist sport. If I can Thank you. To follow, I, I mean, to Richard and, and Stephen's point, this isn't necessarily about wholesale change, right? I think, I think that's the reaction that a lot of people get. Run it alongside with what you're already doing, right? If you can get a 5% increase in conversion or, or efficiency or something like that, if you can deal with edge cases, if you can have a marginal difference, that's a huge impact for the, the fintech, right? We've got customers that uh, have 7.5% reduction in fraud. If if I could save the Scottish fintech or financial services community 1% of fraud, I would retire pretty pretty easily, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't have to be uh, a wholesale shift. And I think get away from those preconceptions. I, I've, I've had friends that have started fintechs, taken, taken the proposition back to their previous business, and, and people have turned around and said, yeah, that's great. When you've been around for three years, to Richard's point, come back and talk to us. Because until you've been around three years, procurement won't even look at you. That fintech could have raised 20 million pounds and have money for a hundred years and still not get through procurement just because it doesn't have three years of audited accounts. You know, we have to start to shift the way we think about these things if we're gonna actually move forward. Hmm. Can I, can I, mean, I jump I, in here? Because I think we've we've touched on a couple of things and, and we might as well like point out the, uh, the the naked emperor for a second. We've started talking about opportunity and I think we've we've established pretty quickly that opportunity was never the issue, right? We've been playing this game for coming on to 15 years now. We know what the opportunity is and the reason we're not capitalizing on the opportunity is everything that has been touched on. The fact that the old way of making money is still quite profitable, the way that our governance inf infrastructures as an industry have not been changed from the inside. We used to joke in every bank I've ever worked in that compliance, audit, risk and legal are the business prevention department. And they used to come into meetings going, ha ha, we know. So the reality is that the things that are holding us back are no secrets. Everything that James just highlighted is known inside and outside of the bank. <clears throat> so. So saying that this is an opportunity is almost giving ourselves a, a reprieve as an industry that we don't necessarily deserve. So if we take a step back and say, we know the technologies are real robust and scalable. We know that there are a lot of things that fintechs trying to sell B2B are, are, are representing that banks cannot do themselves. We know, as was rightly pointed out, that trying to do it in innovation hubs and innovation departments is not the way. We set those up to prove to ourselves that we're capable of learning and testing what well, we are and 10 years have passed and now what? So, so I think I want to I pick up on what James said. It's not about wholesale chains. It's not about wholesale change at the point of sale. But I do think that what we're pointing at is wholesale change at the point of inception. So the bank has to change the way it thinks about its value additive services. And the minute that one of those startups or, or, or um, coalitions come in and say you know what the thing you do i can help you do it faster and cheaper but you have to bring me in for me to help you there uh you're right that the the way that that will transform the end result will not necessarily be wholesale change because we don't even know how to do that but what the bank needs to do to bring that in requires so much change at the governance and and procurement and compliance level so i guess the question we're asking is is what is happening with the pressures that COVID is putting on everyone's infrastructure and you know return on equity expectations and 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 going to finally make banks go you know what the things we've been saying have to change now have to change i'm going to stop, so, stop so, the so, yeah so thank you Lada. that's really really interesting um and challenging as well um the question that we didn't manage to get up on the poll was that um organizations have had to act and think a little bit more like fintechs um, to respond to COVID, large organizations. Do you think this will help um, uh, break down the language barrier with fintech organizations, which kind of ties in with what, what you're really saying? I mean, it's not a language barrier, it, it's culture, it's process, it's risk, it's all of those things. M Matt, I know you've been working quite hard on, on a number of in initiatives to try and draw um, fintech closer to to the, the large banks in in the uk w would you yeah. care to, to give a comment on, on, on yeah this? sure um i mean i think uh, you know i think the the whole covid situation and and the challenges around it i mean i think probably everybody in banks have seen 
um, decision making and some of the governance that, uh, that both James and Leda talk about operating much more quickly because of sort of the need and the situation to respond in a, in a, in a timely manner. And I, and I think, you know, we all hope that that, that won't snap back completely to, to, to the rate of, of progress sort of before that. And, and I think, as you say, I mean, I've been working uh, with, a, with a, a body called the FinTech Delivery Panel, which is uh, looking at ways to improve um, how large financial institutions work with um, with fintechs and other startups in the UK. Um, still very much the start of the journey. Uh, we've we've sort of first and foremost, I guess, a couple of years back, launched um, a guide to onboarding, which at least tries to sort of pull back the curtain and and be a little bit more uh, give more visibility to the sort of questions that banks will ask and and why. And then, literally a couple of weeks back, on the fourteenth, um, we launched the fintech pledge, which was uh, progressed with Tech Nation and uh, sponsored by the Treasury. And I think the one thing that was very positive is all the high street banks signed up to that, and all were enthusiastic about uh, improving the speed, the process, the governance. And, and the ease to which large financial institutions can, can work with fintechs. So I think it's it's seen and understood. I, I do agree, though, that, that the challenge is around, uh, you know, getting to that, that ideal place, cutting through some of the, uh, the, the governance, actually streamlining things and making, making you know, decisions more more easily um, is, is something that still needs a lot of work. So I see it being very much a, as, a, as a start of the journey rather than the end. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it ties back to the poll that we had last time um, where we, we asked a question around the, the cultural change that had taken place to allow things to happen in two weeks that would normally last two years. You know, would, would, would organizations be be able to learn from that and, and go forward from, from that? And I think the jury's out from, from what I'm hearing from most people. Um, you know, I, th I think there is going to be a continued, um, a, a continued speeding up of, of activities. But I think you know, over the next 12 months, we'll really get to see whether that will, will tie in. Letter, I can see that you very much yeah, want to say I'm something about that. I agree with everything that was said, and I respect everything that was said, and I, I should put it out there that I have held innovation roles. I have set up innovation departments. I am part of the problem I'm about to describe. Everything that Matt said is valuable, but we've been on this journey for over 10 years. So what, what worries me is that every time we get together as an industry, we acknowledge the challenges and we celebrate the progress. Both of those things are great. But then we come back together again and it's almost like we have a collective memory loss and we celebrate the same progress. Um, I, I think that the, the position we're in, given how long the journey has been, is, is woefully inadequate. Um, it's, it's reassuring that the pledge has come, but it would mean a lot more had my generation of innovation folk managed to do that 10 years ago when we started the journey. So I'm not putting responsibility on anyone else's shoulder. This is very much, um, I, I am on, on the side, I'm not on the side of the bank anymore, but I was there when the journey started. So I don't put myself out of this. And I would say that the biggest gap I see is that banks started this journey thinking we controlled the timing and content of the conversation. I think the realization that the timing is not in our control is very much there, particularly with the FCA beating a very different drum. And that's great for the industry and great for the consumer. I think that the main thing is missing is the urgency of business imperatives because the, um, the pledges and all the rest of it almost gives a little bit of optionality to it like this might be a good thing it's a nice to have it might enhance us here and there but the the thing that will really accelerate everything is the business imperative of saying if i partner with that startup or if i integrate that technology or if i switch my operations from this stack to that stack it will give me business acceleration that urgency is what is missing and actually to pick up on a point that was made earlier 
that urgency is what is what is going to move startups away from reliance to endless rounds of funding and give them business viability so i think starting talking about money much earlier rather than talking about ways of working is how we're going to accelerate that are you good for my business yes then i'll be good for your business and and off we go I was just coming on later, but I think it's a, it's a really great point, really, into the commerciality. Uh, that's why I'm a bit, to be honest, the idea of a pledge is all, all well and good, but it's more talk rather than action. And the point about action, it leads to the commerciality. Having said that, I don't think you should underestimate, there are some great examples out there often overlooked. One of the most successful fintechs in Europe, based started here in Scotland, called FNZ. Very few people talk about their model and what they've done. That's not in banking, that's not in insurance, that's across the whole investment and pension landscape. Origo, again, based in, uh, in Scotland, been going for 30 years as a fintech in terms of that. So there are some really, really good role models. They're just exceptions, unfortunately, rather than the rule. And they need to be taken as examples of actions that lead to commerciality, which then receive the investment to get the growth rather than into sort of generic sort of statements about, you know, with all due respect, Tech Nation doing a great job, pledges or kind of further government reviews, which don't really contribute to real tangible actions. So Stephen, the, the obvious question from that is, uh, apart from Scotland, which, which clearly is a, an added advantage, um, well, what's the secret sauce for those two organisations? What, what has made them successful in dealing with with organizations um and, and growing and and, and lending the, the, what, what, what was the driving force uh to, to uh, i mean the two drivers for me if you look at a number of the successes when you're adding that nucleus leadership the actual people entrepreneur we've got james here which is a great example entrepreneur but leadership but leadership as a team and that's how they've delivered been resilient through really challenging times just look at the fnz story and the nuclear story that they've been through um, and secondly, is focus on the commerciality, cash flow rather than actually on the funding. Funding is yet important, but funding will come if you've got those that commercial opposition and investable business. So that, for me, are the two ingredients really to build on. Okay, thank you, um, Richard. Um, the, the, the point that Leda made about being money led. Let, let's, let's put it that way. Um, and organisations need to be much more focused. That, that came out, um, I think, in the last session around workforce transformation. Well, one of the key drivers for workforce transformation is it's going to get harder. The, the economy is changing. Um, we, we've got a whole load of, of different views on, on the ways in which organizations need to change things like funding cycles, you know, moving away from, from 12 month budgeting cycles to, to a, a mechanism to, to become much more agile than they are at the moment functional teams um, moving into um, feature teams so you know cross discipline there's a whole world of change going on right now in in those large organizations do, do you think that will um, help you I mean clearly your organization will be looking at that will that drive fintech engagement in your view to a point I will um, Randy, I think let us point really interesting because you know we, we, we can make the demands on either fintechs or corporations to change, but the reality is they still operate in a certain way based on their, on, on their self-interest. They've got, right, so uh, we made the point earlier about the RFP process. So, you know, I, I have, we moved to feature teams, we moved to agile working, all this sort of stuff we talk about in our business. I've still got 40 individuals who want to assess a fintech when it comes to on board of us, literally 40 individuals. And I have to cut all that away. So it's not really about, um, it's not really about words or structures or or agile or feature teams or funding cycles. It's a, in my business, it's about a mindset shift and change from looking for established big four consultancies, Salesforce.com, the big businesses that give us the, the immediate reassurance of security and depth, and wanting to take uh, a different opportunity and a different chance. So that's not structural. It's, it's a mindset thing for me. We've done the structural change, and that's been helpful in many respects. But it's not changed at all, really, our ease of onboarding a fintech or working with them. We've done a bit of the innovation, a bit of the, the playing with fintechs. It's actually damaging fintechs, in my opinion, that we play with because they waste an awful lot of time and capital on nothing, and that's that's just embarrassing, actually. Um, 
Joe, you know, for me, for me, we've got to find a way in our business to have dialogue with companies. You've got a proposal that is commercially viable to us. It's not playing it. We can see the benefit to us, and we can we can realise it quite quickly. Uh, but we have to overcome some of the, um, you know, if you, the, the beauty of having ten years track record for me is almost that somebody else has done it before us, and therefore I can demonstrate to my company that. You know, that, that particular fintech is working with a bank or working with so-and-so or working with so-and-so. It makes my, my, my job a lot easier. So for me, it's not about structure, it's about mindset. Uh, and that's, I think, still hard to solve for. And I think, I, think that's I, think I think that's the leader's point, right? And I would even go as far as to say, I think as a, as a financial services industry, we're damaging fintechs with this idea of adoption and innovation. I don't know how many, and we've fallen into the trap as well, coming along going, oh, there's a big tier one bank who wants a conversation with me. That's fantastic. Three, four, six, eight, 12 months later, I've spent a huge amount of resource and, and time and energy and, and things that I don't have a lot of as a FinTech. You know, this is the most valuable resource I have is this energy and I'm wasting it on a pointless conversation because for all the things that we talked about, that mindset isn't there to actually even do anything, right? So how many FinTechs have run out of steam or momentum or revenue because to Stephen's point, we're being distracted with big elephant hunting and not just generating momentum and traction, right? And I think I think that's hugely detrimental. I don't think we, you know, if we're gonna have a candid conversation here, that that is killing. Actually, these innovation teams are killing so much of the fintech industry because we just don't have that resource to waste. Even in COVID, right? The first phase of COVID, the sense of of most of the businesses the big business i was talking to was we'll wait and see okay now thankfully in some ways we've got at least another six months to live through and hopefully at the end of 12 months we'll have enough new habits and pressures to to maybe move the needle a little bit but we're only talking about moving the needle one or two equivalent salaries you know i mean with businesses with tens of thousands of people all you need to do is give one salary to a fintech to actually run something alongside what you're already doing. I mean, the scales are just incredible, right? I'm asking for 50 grand, 25 grand for a small little project, right? Where I'm offering to save 1% of fraud. Hold on a second. And I've, I've sat down, sorry, I'll finish my rant in a second. I sat down, we, we've been doing open banking for a long time, right? I'll give you a good example of this. We've been doing open banking for a long time. We've had to help build an industry. Why? Because for the first eight of the last 10 years, I was laughed out of most rooms saying, this isn't your data. You'll never, this will never work. You can't do this and all the rest of it. We now live in a completely different world where open banking, bank data is a global trend. Great. Now I can have a real meaningful conversation. About three years ago, I sat down with a bank who wanted us to help them develop a, an ROI on using bank data in their, their onboarding process. We came up with a 4,000% ROI without even trying. And the bank said it wasn't high enough. <laughs> I'll let that sit for a second. Anybody who could have a 4,000% ROI, right, for anything. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think, I, I think the, the, the point, I think that we, I mean, we, we, we obviously we, we, we've had some discussions around this. The, the point for me is around focus. Um, uh, so I think it's probably, it's probably appropriate time to move the conversation on a little bit. And um, you know, one, one of the things that's um, coming out of COVID is that there are a whole uh, a whole different set of interest points um, that, that previously weren't there. So um, I, I think you know the alignment is likely to come when a big organisation needs something for a particular circumstance like COVID, um, and a fintech works really really quickly to run something up that fits that fits the bill. Um, what, what are we beginning to see? now as a result of COVID, other than, than a move to remote work that fintechs can can help with. Um, I, I'm going to pass this over to Stephen. Uh, um, you know, what, what types of things are you seeing um, organisations really home in on, um, thinking forward in, in a world that where digital adoption is now um, certainly a lot higher than it was, and, and ju judging by the last uh, session that we had, um, it, that, that acceleration isn't going to stop where we, we are seeing a whole load of people that are um, losing their jobs, where the economy is challenged, 
um, where we are seeing people not needing to, to live in the locality of where they work because they remote work. You know, in, in, in that rapidly changing environment, how do you think FinTech can help? But I mean, there's two things I would say just to very briefly that I'd pull out that I see. One is, I think I see more of the larger institutions getting much clearer on what their problem statements are and prioritizing those. So what are the key issues? Rather than trying to solve, we talk about transformation, big change. What are the real areas of friction that could be addressed by actually working in partnership in an open innovation way, number one. Number two, starting to see, although the real test will be to come on this, is actually, instead of it being driven by someone senior, like a CEO or managed director who's furthest removed from the problem and furthest removed from the customers, there's a greater empowerment of the actual teams who operationally deliver to customers and in the organization. So they're driving that engagement potentially with the outside uh, FinTech in working in open innovation. So in a way, this shift in leadership of the top person or the top people know what's best, because they don't, they're too removed, um, and turn it upside down. So that's true. Now the test we're coming in is whether that translates in the next 12 months. Okay, and, and any particular areas you, you'd call out? Um, yeah, I mean, the big areas, uh, are, I mean, there are six big themes that we've got the, from the, the sort of the big 14 financial institutions that we work with, from JP Morgan through to NatWest and uh, Bailey Gifford. So the ones are financial crime and cyber, the whole issue around that, which is accelerated, customer vulnerabilities, um, and fintech regulation. Regulatory efficiencies, delivering the regulatory requirements in an efficient way using sort of data. You could combine that across the pieces, open data, open finance, open banking, but they sit across all of those. But there are three, crime, vulnerabilities, and regulation. Okay. Um, uh, Matt, um, from, from your organization's perspective, are, are you seeing those as focus points for, for FinTech engagement? Or are you seeing other things specifically driven out of COVID? Yeah, I'm, I, I mean, absolutely. But I think, uh, you know, I think the, the digital channels are becoming uh, important as well. I mean, I think picking up on the previous comments, I mean, we've always approached innovation f with a definition of uh, about sort of scale innovation, not doing PACs. So we, we don't count innovation successes as, as PACs. It's about, it's actually about making some sort of fundamental change in the organisation. And I think you know, we we have worked and continue to work with fintechs on everything from, you know, financial crime, you know, in the in the reg tech space, uh, in the digital space, uh, looking to sort of improve how customers can actually um, access and understand their finances through digital channels if if the sort of physical face to face channels aren't aren't available, but also. I think also beyond you know the, the sort of personal retail customers into into the sort of business space and and actually seeing you know the requirements from small businesses you know right up to large corporates also wanting to leverage innovation to uh, to 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 operate in a more digital fashion than they have in the past and all of that drives a it drives a massive you know, a massive agenda in, in this sort of space. And I think, you know, part of the challenge for fintechs is, um, particularly with the large organizations, is is they're not only competing against, you know, the 101 other fintechs who are doing similar things, they're also competing against the large tech companies, the gaffers, the consultancies, who, who have all seen the opportunity to get their, you know, you know the piece of the pie of the transformation and and, and have the, the contacts and the networks, uh, going back to the previous point, into the senior levels of the organisation to get the leverage. Yeah, you know, and I think with some of the, the you know, the, the the cultural history, that that does, you know, make it make it quite quite a challenging environment for fintechs. But I think I think the positive side is for for us at least the, the appetite to to actually work with fintechs and 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 take things to scale is there, and we have done it on a, you know, on a you know, on a large number of occasions over the last last five years or so. And do you, let me maybe ask you a, a, a fairly candid question. I mean, financial services, because the way I understand the, the, the world that we live in now, 
the reason why it's so hard to adopt innovation is because the risk adverse engines, right? Everyone's managing risk. Every time something happens, a process is put in place to deal with that in the future, right? So after 20, 30, 50 years, you have an organization that's just kind of like, again, over overwhelmed with, with policy and process. I, I went to an old traditional bank, a bank account I had for 20, 25 years recently. I had to pay 25 pounds to transfer money from my current, my savings account to my other bank's account because there was no direct transfer thing the other day, right? And and in my world, that's just sort of crazy, but I understand why it's there is because, you know, I didn't have a card reader, I didn't have this, I didn't have that, I didn't have the things required to follow the process that's there. Given that there is this burden with existing process, is is does that become the limiting factor? Is that is that why innovation isn't isn't adopted from these fintechs, or is it is it just the cultural bit? Um, and I think I think personally there are there are those process types of things. I mean, I, I guess you know you look at the banks and and probably particularly post the financial crisis going but going back even that far. You know there there are so many regulations to adhere to, whether it's to do with information security, data protection. Um, you know, systems go down, there are heavy sanctions, you, you know, you breach money laundering, there are heavy sanctions, you, you, you have data breaches, there are heavy sanctions. So it's almost easier for a bank to say no until they know it's absolutely safe than it is to, you know, take that risk to innovate, to try something new, to go with, with you know, not the household name that, that gives you some maybe unreasonable sense of security. So I, I think the, you know, the regulation, the processes that back it up, that lead to that risk aversion and the culture are all fairly strongly tied together. Um, and and I guess we've seen a little bit of that busted through, through the COVID situation. And, and but that, that's where I, you know, somewhat see it lying. But you get two great examples, you, you, and, and affordability and that sort of thing. I mean, banks have been fined and continue to get fined hundreds of millions of pounds because of inadequate processes, right? You know, we see that in the news all, once a month for the last five years, I've seen it in the news from somewhere around the world, right? So there's, you know, just doing what you've always done because you have that process and that policy isn't necessarily the right answer. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of alternatives with these things. How do we get some of that ROI appreciation understanding? How do we bridge that gap? Anyways, sorry, I'll shut up. But, but, but I think but I think you're actually sort of that conversation you just had is exactly the conversations we've been having in our in our meeting rooms for the last 10, 15 years. And for me, the biggest challenge we, we have to face is change the language a little bit. So I had a job 20 years ago, dating myself really badly here, which would have been called a fintech company if we had the language, but we didn't have the language. It was just a small software company selling stuff that the bank we were selling into didn't didn't have a process for and um we didn't make a huge success of ourselves but we managed to sell it into deutsche bank and in the end sell everything into deutsche bank and and everyone was happy and all of that happened pretty quickly um uh, because there wasn't a landscape and there wasn't a big thing that the bank had to digest we had something they wanted um and they found a way of consuming it fast forward a few years later there were hundreds of companies like us and there was so much new technology so we coined the term fintech and put all manners of sins underneath it which was mostly stuff we don't understand and don't know what to do with and this was a lot of emergent tech that we didn't know how to how to use that we didn't know if we could trust it that the regulator wasn't sure about but also all ways of working that were new to us so all of that went into a bucket and look i was lucky to be in a position inside a bank when that started that it could do so much accelerated learning by osmosis 10 years on and you cannot have your api layer your ai your crypto assets your ways of working and your ux team sitting under that because it's not one thing it's a million things and yet banks still talk about working with fintechs in in a way that is so hazy and, and diffuse. And I will go back to what I was saying earlier. It cannot be driven by a vague desire to innovate. That was 10 years ago. It has to be driven by burning commercial priorities. This will be better for the fintech and it will be better for the, for the bank. It will also be a more honest conversation. 
But the reality is a lot of the things that are not just a bad experience on the glass need to have happened years ago or if, at least months ago. And Ian and I had this conversation offline um, a, a couple of days ago. It all blends into one now. But um, about the fact that when the, <clears throat> the requirement came for all banks to change their loan repayment schedules, all the stuff they hadn't done months and years previously because it was onerous, expensive, to very valid points Matt made, compliance and risk felt that moving your, I don't know, your loan origination or your core to an event-driven architecture was too risky and too dangerous. Well, then the government says you have to change your loan repayment schedule and everything you have is on COBOL and it takes two months of solid coding efforts and people not sleeping for weeks and end to deliver against the requirement. That was painful and banks are proud of what they achieved and rightly so because their people pulled out all the stops. But I'm not hearing everyone going, you know what, forget my innovation department, forget the drones, forget to Matt's point, the POCs. What I need is a radical infrastructure change because I might be in a similar position again in a few weeks and months. I need new technology. This is where FinTech comes in because I don't know as a bank how to set up an event-driven architecture for all my loan repayments. And there are people out there who can and, and, and do. So compliance and procurement help me bring them in safely. I don't think that conversation is taking place enough right now. And for me, that's what COVID should have done. Taken out all the noise and said, okay, we have business imperatives, commercial imperatives. We're not gonna do experiments anymore. We will only work with FinTechs that help us deliver business outcomes services to our customers and return to our shareholders. If you don't do that, you're out. And if you do that, procurement and compliance will find a way of bringing you in safely. I, I think they are all very valid points. Um, so, so the question is, do you think COVID will do that? We'll, we'll force that change. Yes. Um, no, <laughs> no, I don't. I don't think we will do that and I'll tell you why. Um, Everything we've said, so there, there are three main reasons. One is everything we've said so far still holds, but now the pressure is even higher. Compliance, procurement, all of those governance structures that need to change in ways that are uncomfortable and unknowable, we know about, but they're still there and they still have the old shape. The second reason is that um, every bank I work with and every banker I know is giving me the same feedback, which is, we are sort of treating the months of disruption as as that and we're looking at the committed projects the committed revenues the committed work and taking stock as to what we can still deliver what has to be pushed out to next year and what can't be done nobody said armageddon guys we have to rethink everything um understandable why and i don't think we need to patronize our audience with saying why this is happening and why it's understandable but you have a lot of people who haven't slept properly in months who are homeschooling their kids who are getting beaten up in all directions because they're not delivering against their commitments they are not in the right mindset to go we're going to change everything and i think the third reason conversely is that they did it through sheer dog-mindedness talent hard work and human effort they managed to deliver against the changing requirements, even though their technology is held together by sticky tape. They're proud of that and they should be, but the feeling is we need to take stock, we need to breathe, we need to salvage what we can. Changing all of that governance is hard. And look, even though our technology is rickety, we did it. So this is not the time to take on more risk and take on more pressure. And if I were inside a bank right now, sitting at a four hour risk committee, I think I would find it very hard to convince anyone, despite the impassioned speech I would be giving. Thank you, thank you. Um, really, really interesting discussion. Um, and I'm sure that many of the attendees on the call recognize some of the issues and challenges um, from, from all of the, um, the panelists. Um, I just want to use the, the last minutes that we have um, just talking about another subject that, that's driven uh, from COVID, which is the, the move to remote and virtual working. Um, my, my, certainly many of my experiences with fintech organizations is walking into a, a, a WeWork type office, um, other brands are available, um, and seeing a bunch of people who are um, clearly collaborating, working closely together, 
having fun, having a sense of purpose, driven, you know, it's an exciting place to be. Um, but the common factor is they're all sitting in the same place. Um, COVID has, has moved away from that. Um, and we are now all working remotely. Um, and that does bring challenges. We talked about it last time. Um, incidentally, the general view last time was absolutely we would stay in this model of largely remote working and with maybe some hybrid activities. Um, J James, um, what's your perspective um, you know, sitting in a fintech organization? Do you need to, to have that hotbed of, um, of activity in the same geographic location to get the same benefit? uh absolutely not i mean i i've 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 had that with with the business that we have for the last sort of five ten years i think the four months leading up to the lockdown i was actually only in edinburgh about four weeks it doesn't stop anything it hasn't stopped anything since the lockdown i'm in lewis for the next couple of weeks then i'll be in spain doesn't matter people are moving around doing things i i, I don't see any any limitation by being remote I think it does it does require a change, right? We have to think about employee wellness and staff wellness in a different way. We can't keep doing the same few big things all the time. People are are, are starving for 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 interaction, the extroverts, the whatever, the, the 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 conversation, that sort of bonding sort of experience. I think wellness needs to change. I think the the way we manage people and and projects and teams have to change. You can't just rely on the water cooler effect and osmosis to kind of fill in the gaps. You know, you have to kind of change the way you're working and, and that sort of thing. But if you do all that, why not? You know, I mean, what's most, most FinTechs that I know these days have been completely remote. They have people in Hungary or Australia or wherever. And those that have had bases have only had it to try and entertain the big banks and people coming in for meetings mainly, right? Or to get together for beer on a Friday, you know? Uh, a lot of the fintechs I know today that have had offices are never going to go back to that space, right? There's just, there's no reason to pay for it. You know, we're talking commercials here, right? A lot in the conversation. There's no reason to pay for a big office if you don't need it. And, and, and Richard, um, from an organization that I, I can imagine was, was very much office-based previously, and you're now working much more remotely. Do you think that that creates a, almost a, a leveler um, a, around your relationships with other other organisations. You know, you're not you're not all sitting together every day. You, you now have the potential to, to work uh, more collaboratively with other organisations in in the virtual world. Is is that is that a fair? Question? Absolutely. Um, so we we're not a company with the scale to have uh, either the good or the bad of innovation hubs that others have had and tried and worked or not worked. So we don't, we don't have that. We've got our own office. We Try to set it up to collaborate in effectively. So we suffer from the same issue everybody else does in terms of remote working uh, and opportunity. But it's not obvious to me that fintech collaboration is any harder uh, remotely because suddenly we've broken down this office where we're working and then you're not, um, and we can create a much more of a virtual space online. Um, you know, we 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 become more fragmented and therefore that lets others come into our team effectively without the same same barriers. I think it's a great opportunity for us to collaborate better. Okay. I, I, I think it's a, an opportunity on a barrier, personally. Uh, that's great. I pr probably just got time for one more comment. So I'll, <clears throat> I'll, I'll throw the question open to, to, to Stephen. You know, what's your view on remote working, um, uh, running running the organisation that you're being responsible for the organisation you, you have? Yeah, it, it's creating a new paradigm. And to be honest, I've never been busier than this last six months, really, than a previous sort of two years. And uh, I do miss my time going on the bus in Edinburgh uh, and Glasgow and Dundee. So I'm missing that physical experience of, of moving. But um, I think what's the thing, though, there's a new paradigm. And that paradigm is, yeah, not hubs, not specific buildings, but communities. Communities, actually, where there's still a physical location. People still need to live. People still want that social side and then work. And what you've got being established, the digital tech quarter in the west of um, Edinburgh, the Glasgow City Innovation District, on the Clyde as well, is more the community type orientation rather than specialist buildings. And I think that will help this new paradigm shift of combining the virtual world with the physical world. And we're human beings. At the end of the day, we like to be engaging with each other physically and virtually. Well, let's let's hope um, 
that that begins to open up that opportunity it opens up again for us in the near future uh, to, to all the panelists thank you it's been a fantastic discussion this morning i've really enjoyed um being with you in this session graham um over to you <coughs> Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Ian, and you know, thank you to the panelists, and thank you, Ian, for your tremendously professional facilitation. Um, it's been a fascinating, um, open and challenging discussion, and just as an observer from, uh, as I end my tenure as CEO over the past five years, the fact we can have a fascinating, open and challenging discussion is in itself tremendous progress. So um, I'd just like to note that and that openness, uh, openness itself, we must make sure uh, uh, we maintain that going forward. Um, the other big recurring theme for me is just the sheer appetite there is uh, for large financial services organisations and fintechs to work together. And, you know, these kind of events, I think, are absolutely critical in in having this, you know, this kind of open discussion, say, well, look, how do we make the situation uh, even better uh, and enable even further working together? Um, the fact as well that in, in business breakfast briefings five years ago, I would be in a room in Edinburgh and I wouldn't have uh, James dialing in from Lewis and Lydia from Greece and uh, Richard from Sussex. So uh, in itself, you, know, you can see how much things have changed and i'm sure as we go through this pandemic further changes will need to take place so without further ado i'd just like to um thank ian bradbury uh i'd like to thank matt james i'd like to thank richard caldicott uh to james varga uh stephen ingledew and to uh Lida Glyptus as well thank you very much indeed for joining this event number three is going to be a treat that will take place on the 29th of October 10 a.m. and I'll be looking at the impact of workplace transformation on DNI in a post-COVID-19 world. Goodness knows where we will be by the time we get to the uh, 29th of October. Further challenges ahead, no doubt. But thank you very much indeed, everybody. Thank you to all our members for joining and in such numbers. I look forward to speaking to you all very, very soon. Cheerio for now. <laughs>